Welcome everyone. Welcome. We'll let folks trickle into the Zoom room. So welcome, my name is Sarah Switzer and I am the CBR Canada's program coordinator and I will be the moderator for today's session with fantastic speakers, Claudia Mitchell, Hani Sadati and Shannon Roy, who I will introduce shortly. This event is being recorded and closed captioning is enabled. You can toggle it off or on by clicking on the three dots of the bottom of your screen and I'll have Sonia pop those instructions into chat as well. So today's session, Online Participatory Research in COVID-19 Youth Stories Through Cell Films, is our eighth and final part in our eight-part series on community-based research in COVID-19, addressing widening inequities and amplifying community-based visions for change. I am so excited for this conversation today. I have had the personal pleasure of working with folks at the Participatory Cultures Lab on a few participatory visual research initiatives over the years, and I have learned so much from them um, over time about co-creation, ethics, and collaborative media production. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the CBR Canada Secretariat is situated on the traditional territories of the Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Many of you may be calling in from different locations, and so I invite you all to introduce yourself over chat. Say hello, welcome, um, including let us know, you know, where are you calling in from? Where are your feet planted today, uh, including the territories that you may be calling in from. And if you don't already know, nativeland.ca is an excellent resource. I'm personally zooming in from Takaranto, it's covered by Treaty 13, and I am so grateful to be here with all of you today. We have a real mix of folks in the audience, and I'm so pleased you could join us. So in each of our webinars, we begin um, our events by really reflecting on and amplifying the goals of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. And in the spirit of reconciliation, CBR Canada is committed to engaging with and learning from diverse Indigenous peoples and communities across Canada, as well as addressing the TRC calls to action. This month, we're highlighting call to action number 66. We call upon the federal government to establish multi-year funding for community-based youth organizations to deliver programs on reconciliation and to establish a national network to share information and best practices. Our speakers today will be talking about their project, Canadian Youth Talk About a Pandemic Experiences, as well as participatory online methodologies like self-filming for work with young people more broadly. And in this dialogue, one of the things I wanna invite us to think about as we, as we start here, you know, where do we start our conversations, is how might participatory visual methods such as self-films, how might they be used in community-based youth organizations to amplify those larger conversations on reconciliation? And I hope we can continue reflecting on these overlaps and interconnections with the TRC today and during our breakout discussions following our formal presentation. So here's our agenda for today. For those of you who have joined many CBR Canada events uh, in the past, we're going to mix things up a little bit today. We're, we're going to do things differently. So um, Today, rather than having a webinar only and following up with a live discussion in a week, we're joining uh, two events into one. So following today's presentation by our fabulous speakers, we will pose some discussion questions that our speakers have uh, developed to be discussed in breakout groups before coming back to a full group debrief. All right, breakout groups and the large group debrief will not be recorded, we'll just be recording the, the formal webinar kind of portion of today. That being said, um, as we always do, we'll take some high level notes from the discussion and we'll use these to create an infographic infographic that we will share widely um, to kind of really continue the conversation that we, we have today. And I'm going to ask Sonia to put a link to our agenda in chat so that you have a, a record of this and you have a bit of a sense of where we are going. A few more housekeeping details before we uh, kick off. If you have any questions throughout, please send a message to Sonia. She's marked, uh, her name is marked for tech in chat. Uh, and Sonia, I'll have you wave uh, uh, and say hello. That's great. I can see Sonia waving. <laughs> uh, we ask that Sonia, please, excuse me, we ask that people stay muted during this event, unless, of course, we're in open discussion. And finally, just in case you're joining right now, closed captioning is enabled if you require it. Um, and if there are any access needs you have throughout, please send us a message. 
Lastly, for those of you who are new to CBR Canada, uh, we are a membership-based organization whose mission is to advance community-based research excellence in Canada by strengthening partnerships, building capacity, mobilizing knowledge, and championing CBR amongst individuals, communities, and institutions. We are a social enterprise funded entirely by our over 40 members, uh, and the Center for Community-Based Research um, is the CBR Canada Secretariat, which means that CCBR operates the day-to-day -day activities of CBR Canada. And as part of our programs, we host several events, including webinars and live discussions, much like today. We also operate a community of practice, so please come out. Um, there may be a number of you on the call um, who joined last, uh, last week, uh, or last month, rather, um, where we focused on kind of uh, or, or heard from uh, Carolina Cunningham, Cynthia Padu, and, and their team on Indigenous-led approaches to youth homelessness. Uh, another example of an event we recently ran uh, was in December, led by uh, Dr. Artavan Arjadad, Devin Jones, and his team on youth education, equity, and racial justice. Uh, and both webinars and infographics are online under resources. So just a bit of a sampling of, of different events that we have, and we encourage you to check them all out online. So let's get started. I feel very grateful to be introducing our presenters today, Dr. Claudia Mitchell, founder of the Participatory Cultures Lab and Distinguished James McGill Professor at the Faculty of Education, McGill University. Dr. Hani Sadati, postdoctoral researcher with the Participatory Cultures Lab at the Faculty of Education as well. And Shannon Roy, who's a PhD student in the Participatory Culture Lab also in the Faculty of Education at McGill. And all of these fine folks um, are um, part of the Participatory Cultures Lab, one of CBR Canada's members. So I'm gonna ask Sonia to pop these bios into chat uh, for Claudia, Hani, and Shannon. Fantastic. So folks can uh, give a read uh, of all of their all the work that uh, they've been doing and are up to. So without further ado, I am so excited. I'm going to pass it off to all of you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for that, such, such a warm welcome. And uh, it's so lovely to be here with everyone today. Uh, we'll just start with our, our own land acknowledgement on the next slide, and then I'll carry on from there. Um, so next slide, Hani. So we're on McGill, at McGill University, situated on the traditional territory of the Kanin Kahaha. Uh, territory, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. We recognize and respect the Kanin Kahaha as the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which, on which we meet today. So we'll just, uh, just to say a little bit about what we're going to do in the next uh, 20 some minutes. Um, so what we're going to talk about uh, to start off with why Canadian youth in COVID-19, and it's very exciting to think of the other seven uh, pieces that you've already done on COVID-19 uh, and why participatory visual methodologies as a way to talk about this work. Uh, so I'll do that introduction, then we're going to go on to Hanny, who's going to talk very specifically about a, pro a funded project that we have called Canadian Youth Talk About the Pandemic Experience, SciTape. And we'll, we'll show you some cell films from there. And in our third part of the presentation, uh, Shannon is going to tell us a little bit more about what we're learning. The process, the project is still underway. So these are preliminary pieces, but it give you an idea of what, what we're seeing around in the, the context of this uh, community of young people uh, with whom we are working. So um, why Canadian youth and COVID-19? Uh, I think one of the, well, we, we, we're, I think we're inundated in some ways with, with media, with uh, such attention to uh, the impact on, on everybody in different ways, but certainly the impact of the pandemic on young people. And um, I have a numerous reports of people are interested in following up on this, but certainly um, uh, the Stats Canada's work, uh, lockdown life on mental health impacts of COVID. Uh, UNICEF has done a number of studies and they're actually going 
going to uh, launch a report card on Canada's uh, attention to youth uh, during the during the pandemic. Uh, I think it's on May the 24th. But I think what's been really clear is there's like such broad areas. It's when we think about young people and in our our work, we're thinking mostly 15, 16 years old, up to 24, uh, clearly issues of education, uh, leaving, leaving uh, grade school, going into university, what kind of employment is available, what kind of, you know, what, what are, what social security networks are there or aren't. Um, lots of work on mental health in terms of studying it, but not necessarily always what we're going to do about it. And I think even the areas such as sexual and reproductive health uh, that we, we kind of get lost. Uh, and like, what are young people doing? And what, what, what's the impact on like their own social life and well-being as well? So these are like, there's certainly lots out there to think about. Uh, and what we're going to do is try to get, get at some of the perspectives of young people themselves. So just moving on to the next slide, Hanny. Um, what we're interested in, um, in in the literature review that we were doing, have been doing from 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 the moment this started, uh, is to recognize that out of all of those reports and studies and uh, pieces that are out there, there's no one story, no one experience of the pandemic. And I know many people are interested in intersectionalities, uh, thinking of disability and homelessness and uh, race or and class. And so to try to think of all the range of intersectionalities and experiences, uh, we realized that it's really important to get at these different stories, to find out if there is no one story, what are the kinds of stories? What will they help us uh, understand about experiences? And, and maybe ultimately, uh, will we be ready for the next pandemic or will we be able to live through this one in a more, um, a more effective and more impactful way. So that's kind of like a little bit of a backdrop. Um, maybe to the next slide, Hanny. In terms of framing the study, um, we are, as um, uh, Sarah has pointed out, uh, have been doing a lot of work on participatory research for you know quite a long time. Uh, the the lab we started the PCL, the Participatory Cultures Lab, in 2010, and one of the areas that we have found very effective uh, is to look at well, issues like photo voice, digital storytelling, but particularly cell filming. The idea of using uh, your own little, uh, whatever version of a cell phone, mobile phone you have, um, or an iPad or another device, uh, to make short videos uh, to address a challenge, a concern, or a community issue. They're really a, a form of storytelling via short usually two minutes or less uh, self uh, uh, films. And so that kind of frames the, the work that we've, we've been thinking about. And maybe just to the next slide, Hanny. Um, this work, of course, has been around for a while. Uh, a group of us put together a book on the handbook of participatory video, which is kind of maybe the maybe the mother of cell filming. Uh, so the work uh, around using uh, camcorders and all range of equipment, uh, was, which really dominated a lot of the research that I did, like between 2004 and 2010. And we, you know, there are other books on this, but the handbook of participatory video was a, a key one to put together and it's now it's a uh, guess it's, it came out in 2012 so it's its 10th anniversary uh, but that also immediately took us into uh, adaptations and not carrying heavy equipment into communities and thinking that we're somehow bringing participatory visual methodologies to people the the idea of cell films uh, and cell filming and cell phones and mobile technology is actually working with people with, with, with what people already have and so three uh, three of my former doctoral students uh, Kate Katie McEntee Casey Burkholder and Joshua Schwab Schwab Cartes uh, edited a book in 2016 uh, that really picked up on all of these adaptations into what's a cell film and integrating mobile phone technology and uh, participatory visual research and activism and building on uh, the work in South Africa of Jonathan Dockney and um, uh, K.N. Tomaselli who coined the term cell film or cell phone plus video in the first place. So what really intrigued us about uh, thinking about this work is, is the process of how, how cell filming as a methodology kind of 
provides for this co-production and production of knowledge. So we just have a, uh, a, a little slide here that uh, uh, Nessa, um, uh, uh, Bandar Bandarchian, who in the PCL put together uh, for us, which kind of just looks at the process of going from how, what do we learn about visual ethics? How do we think about brainstorming and, and group coming, groups coming together? The whole idea of planning out and storyboarding, the filming process, the screening process, and as we will talk about a little bit later this afternoon, the reflexive process uh, and why this is more than just, you know, shooting uh, a few minutes of film and how we how we plan that out. So just going to the, the next slide. That, that I guess what has really, really dominated our thinking about this work uh, with young people and in the context of COVID is to take this question, can uh, participatory visual methodologies lead to social change? And of course, you know, there are often exaggerated claims for what any methodology can do. Uh, but one of the things that we try to study throughout our work is where have we found really strong, powerful examples? And so I'm just going to end my little section on talking about um, the use of cell films and digital storytelling in one of the sites we've been working with in, in South Africa, uh, where the girls in a project called Networks for Change, which you'll see in the top left-hand uh, corner, were acting out a scenario about forced and early marriage and why that was such a critical part of how they were thinking of gender-based violence. So the creative short like two to three minute um, digital story cell film um, in the in the slide right next to it you'll see them screening their cell film in a typical classroom in a rural area of South Africa uh, the whole idea is that, that you know they introduced it they produced it they talked about it um, they also as they were working on the at, at fine, once they had worked on the cell film and saw how powerful it was also more people became interested in, in demonstrating and marching. So something that started out as a visual methodology went to something that was actually very embodied as far as marching to think about rape culture and how to look at this. Uh, the, the fourth slide, the fourth, fourth image is a, is, a, is a community policy discussion that came out of the day of the march, that came out of showing the film. And ultimately, um, this is like over two or three years, and so you can't really see that in four slides or four images, um, that the chief of the community that they worked in and many of the um, elders and many of the teachers said, we have to do something about this. And I can uh, report that as of March 2020, uh, the chief went to the Peter Maritzburg legislature and they ultimately adopted something called the Lost Cop that's the name of their community, protocol to address forced and early marriage in rural South Africa. It was a, a real life policy that came out of the story at the top. Uh, and so this is uh, documented on the IDRC uh, website if anybody wants to, hear, wants to hear more about it. And there are numerous articles about it. But it's that idea that starting with the stories from young people can go places and can maybe sometimes take, be taken out of their hands at a certain point and into the hands of adults, but back to them uh, to, to think about the impact uh, and think about social change. So I'm just gonna turn it over now to Hanny, who's going to kind of take us into, that was our dream, I guess, of what can we do? Uh, and why do we wanna know about this work from the perspectives of young people over to SciTing? So over to you, Hanny. Claudia and uh, hi everyone. <clears throat> thank you, Claudia, and thank you, Sarah, for the nice introduction. So I will give uh, an overview of the project that we are currently doing. So the title is Canadian Youth Talking About Pandemic Experiences, or we, what we call Cytape. Uh, so uh, the project basically um, tries to look at the pandemics through the eyes of youth, Canadian youth, uh, and it has been funded by uh, Quebec's Ministry of Health and Social Services. In this project, we try to learn more about how young people see the pandemic related issues, how they see the steps for moving forward, and in general, how they can be engaged in co-production of knowledge about the pandemic. Also, we would like to explore the use of a participatory visual approach to engage young people in the co-production of the knowledge. 
After receiving McGill's uh, Research Ethics Board approval on the project, we started recruiting the participants from across Canada. And we did, uh, we did that by circulating uh, the flyers among our networks, through social media, and reaching out to various communities that specifically work with youth in Canada. And uh, just to mention that uh, we are still recruiting more participants. So we, wel we welcome anyone who is between 16 to 24 years old in Canada and is interested in participating uh, in this project. Uh, my colleague Shannon will put the uh, flyers in the chat if, if, in case you need. Um, so as part of our recruiting strategy, we approached uh, more than uh, 20 organizations uh, that are working, sorry, uh, more than 20 organizations that are working with, uh, with youth or part of their work relates to youth issues in Canada. And we received support from a considerable number of organizations uh, by uh, introducing uh, uh, young people to, uh, to join our project, to participate in it. Uh, as an overview of the participants so far, um, we are working with uh, youth between 16 to 24 years old, as I mentioned, who live in Canada. So, so far, so far uh, we had uh, 86 uh, youth uh, um, that approached us uh, by sending emails uh, and requesting to join. Um, we had 35 youth completed the whole process. Uh, we are doing, it, doing uh, the process in two sessions that I will explain uh, shortly. And we had, uh, overall, we had 20, uh, 26 cell films uh, that have been submitted. Uh, in terms of the uh, demography, we had uh, most of our participants so far have been uh, have been identified themselves as, e as female. Uh, and uh, we had about uh, a little more than 10% uh, uh, people uh, that identified themselves as male. And uh, from the provinces, we had uh, from we had from uh, so far we had from five provinces, uh, uh, but most of them were from Ontario and Quebec, as you see in the chart. In terms of the data collection process, um, we organized two one-hour sessions for each group of participants. Uh, we had a different number of participants in each in each session. Uh, so it has been small groups of two to seven uh, people in each session. As I mentioned, each session is uh, one hour. Uh, the first uh, session, uh, which we call orientation session, uh, we go through the cell film production process and we discuss some, um, um, some uh, items, like some points like what is cell filming. Uh, we show, we screen some examples of cell films about we, we have an overview of uh, different genres or formats or styles that, uh, that people can, uh, can use in their cell films, um, some uh, ethical considerations. Um, and, and we have a uh, few minutes of discussion about the issues, uh, the experiences that, the, that, uh, that participants had, the stories that they wanna sh uh, share. Um, um, we, we talk about uh, storyboarding or planning before uh, before uh, cell film production, uh, some few uh, filming techniques, uh, introduction of uh, more resources if they if people want to learn more about how to do cell filming to see, to see more examples of cell films, and uh, we ask people specifically to uh, uh, share their cell films by uploading it on YouTube, but not making it public, uh, making it as unlisted. So that just uh, the people who has the link uh, to see the uh, to see the uh, videos, and at the end of the session one, we have a Q and A uh, for that. Uh, and specifically, the prompt that we uh, we provide, we give to the uh, participants to create their cell films in response to this prompt is uh, how was how have. COVID related restrictions affected you and how have you managed to cope with them? What would you like parents, teachers, professors, or policymakers to know about your experiences of the pandemic? So this is what, what happens in session one. And then, uh, uh, then participants have about one week. It depends on their, uh, so we agree on that uh, so that when, when they can join for their second session, but uh, between the first session and second session, they have time to um, to produce uh, to produce uh, to create their cell films. So uh, 
just before the before the second session, they shared the uh, sessions with us, and then uh, we gather again with participants uh, online um, for the second session. The second session is a screening and discussion, and in that session, we uh, so uh, participants have the chance to introduce their cell films. Then there is a screening of the cell film, and then we have some uh, discussion questions as guiding questions to. Uh, to discuss about uh, their cell films and uh, talk about uh, the critical issues that raised uh, uh, in uh, in their cell films. I will I will uh, I will uh, show some some of those discussion questions later. But uh, before I'm going to screen three of uh, uh, three of uh, the cell films that uh, we had uh, just as an example and to give you an idea of the, what what are these. Uh, so uh, these cell films are about. So this is the uh, as I mentioned. As I mentioned, we had some um, some uh, questions in uh, in session two, the, and these are the guiding questions that we uh, we put on the screen uh, so that we, uh, we 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 discuss with participants about their cell films. So uh, questions like, what do you see as the key themes? What do you think these cell films say? Do you think they 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 speak to any particular audience. Uh, what changes are the cell films calling for? Did you learn anything about yourself in the process of creating cell film or during this workshop? What would be your takeaway from the whole process? So I uh, would discuss, uh, discuss these uh, questions um, or anything else that the participants want to share uh, during the second session. And yeah, that's it. So I'm going to... Uh, uh, pass the floor to my colleague Shannon so that uh, she can speak about uh, our learnings from the pro project. Shannon, over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Hani, Claudia, and Sarah. And I am going to talk about uh, what we have learned um, as a research team. And we found that there's two main areas that we've uh, had a lot of learning in, and that is the process and the topic. So particularly when we talk about process, we're talking about uh, how we have been able to facilitate online cell film workshops and conducting these workshops with people who sometimes don't know each other at all versus we have workshops where people know each other very well and they're pre-existing groups and the dynamics of this is quite different. We have learned a lot about facilitating workshops in in the sense that many of these people are talking about very personal stories and experiences and um, they're sensitive topics and so we're learning about how to conduct that. We're also learning about uh, what Canadian youth are experiencing during the pandemic and that's a really important component of this as well and we're learning how youth are using cell films to communicate these experiences. Thank you. So in terms of learning about the process of facilitating online cell film workshops, we've learned that providing detailed instructions in the initial workshop and answering questions uh, quite quickly is important so that the youth feel comfortable and confident when they're creating their cell films and within the workshops themselves. We've learned that follow-up emails are really important because uh, it, it's, it's important. These many of the youth are very busy with school and work, and so sending emails to them to remind them about the workshops and and what uh, we would like to see from them in the workshops has been important as well. We have uh, found that asking participants to talk about their cell film prior to the viewings is really important. Originally, we asked them to put a couple of sentences in the YouTube videos uh, if, they, if they chose. And we found that most weren't doing that, but it was really important to get a little bit of background about their cell film prior to seeing it. So that was really helpful to get them to speak about it before we watched their cell film. We found that giving encouragement and positive feedback during the screening was really important in terms of uh, getting youth to feel confident speaking within the workshop and um, just feeling uh, good about what they have done helped to uh, create a more rich discussion. 
open-ended guiding questions also helped to uh, facilitate a, a more rich discussion amongst the members. And also, it was important to have asynchronous material for the participants. So we had uh, small videos that helped them guide them through creating their cell films that they could access at any time, and we found that beneficial as well. In terms of learning about uh, what youth want to tell us in regards to uh, their experiences during the pandemic, there's an overwhelming uh, there's an overwhelming voice saying that youth wanted the opportunity to express their views and opinions on the changes that were taking place in the world during the pandemic. We found that many youth were saying that there is a greater need for mental health supports for them while they're going through this experience. We found that they are really looking for flexibility in terms of work and schooling um, as these environments shift to online platforms. There's some things that we learned as well that were unexpected during, um, during this process. And one is that we saw that there's an awareness uh, of the challenges that teachers and adults in their lives are facing. There's an empathetic, uh, there's an empathetic, um, uh, a voice within that. So they see that the challenges that, that teachers are facing. We've seen youth who don't know each other appreciating and supporting one another. We've seen um, that many youth are saying that they're building bonds with their family, stronger bonds with their families during isolation, and that they do have new hope for navigating the future. Another really important thing that we saw was a significance of the story behind the story. And this means that when we started asking youth about why they made the choices that they did in the creation of their cell film, that there was a lot of really important information behind that. So the story behind the story and asking them was very important. There are many genres and techniques that participants are using uh, to create their cell films. We're seeing melodramas and skits. We're seeing a lot of monologues where participants are speaking directly to the camera and talking about their experiences. We're seeing cue cards as we did um, the example earlier. We're seeing drawings, uh, puppets as we also saw today, photo montages, video montages, interviews, and even animation. We have changed the prompt slightly over time. So we originally started with how have COVID related restrictions affected you and how have you managed to cope with them? And what would you like parents, teachers, professors or policymakers to know about your experiences of the pandemic? And we've decided to change that just recently to, um, we have heard a lot from young people in this project about what it has been like for them during the pandemic. But we wanna hear from you on what will help you to move forward or what gives you hope? And what we would like, what would you like parents or teachers or policymakers to know about this? And the reason that we changed the prompt was that we've seen that COVID has been changing over time. And particularly when we created the original prompt, things have changed quite a lot. And we originally saw the prompt being something that participants looked at in the past, but we're still in the midst of the pandemic. And so it was important to change the prompt. And we really wanted to see how youth saw hope and the future, um, and maybe potentially uh, looking at things in a more positive light as, as we move on. So thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Claudia to talk about our next steps. Uh, thank you, Shannon. So this is just really our last slide of uh, where we're going with this. And I, I think you, as, you, as you've heard from Shannon, uh, the kinds of issues that, that, that people have been looking at and what, what we're learning about young people themselves uh, who are in a different, who are in a, a community that's often the community of young people, but not necessarily individuals knowing each other, which is, I think, a very important distinction. Uh, and as, as Shannon has pointed out, 
the changing landscape has been a really critical part of this. Uh, when we first proposed to do this project in 2020, um, I think it was like in April of 2020, we wondered whether the, co the pandemic would be over before the funding would be awarded. Uh, I mean, that's kind of like the mentality of what is this? And now, of course, we, 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 we have, you know, there are so many different ways of thinking about, are we living with the pandemic? There are new versions of the pandemic, a uh, whole, so much, so much to think about. Uh, we're heading into more sessions with various communities. We have, uh, we've, as we've had some diversity, but we're looking to work with some uh, indigenous communities that are already part of a project that we're involved in. Uh, we're looking, we're, as uh, Hanny mentioned, we're looking to recruit more people uh, in, different, in different areas, both high school and university or out of school altogether. Um, probably the most exciting challenge for us is thinking about what to do with this amazing data. How can the data, the visual data itself remain visual? Uh, what arts-based approaches can be used? So we've done you know, some thematic analyses and so on, but they don't, that we, 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 we want to do more with this. And um, just even thinking about how could all these cell films become their own montage? Uh, and of course, we are just in the process of sharing our preliminary uh, results with the Ministry of Health and Social Security. Um, and you know, ultimately, uh, what difference can this make? What will they want to do with this? What kinds of, what, how, how can we report this? And uh, in kind of with what expectations that will um, make a difference in terms of what young people themselves have been uh, asking for. So that's where we are right now. We have another, you know, six months of field work that we will be doing before we kind of wrap up field work. And, but we're also doing this uh, analysis piece at the same time. Um, so we're going to stop there right now uh, because we're going to open it up to uh, Q&A and um, or maybe just to go back one, one slide to acknowledging uh, that we're working with a much larger team at McGill uh, who are from you know, both education and health, uh, family medicine, and uh, just to acknowledge everyone in that and of course to acknowledge the amazing young people who've participated in this project so far uh, and uh, who have given given so much. So that's us right now. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll come back. Just if, well, I'm gonna throw this out. In addition to recruiting people for this project, we also have an annual cell film festival. So we'll just put this in the chat. Uh, so if you want to make a cell film, anybody, any age from zero to 150, uh, reimaginings, uh, and it's a community-based uh, community uh, approach. So we're encouraging people to work together. There's also prizes for people who want to do cell films on their own as well. So. Over to Q&A, and thank you very much, uh, Shannon and Hanny, and thank you, audience, for being here. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia, Hani, uh, Shannon. That was uh, that was terrific. That was such a terrific um, presentation. All right, so uh, we're just going to do a bit of a, a, a slide sh swap because I'm going to share my screen in a moment. So just a moment here, bear with us. I'm gonna bring our presenters up on screen. Okay, terrific, fabulous. So what we're gonna do um, uh, for Q&A is if you have questions, we invite you to enter them into chat. Um, and uh, we'll just give folks a moment to uh, enter those questions in. And while folks are thinking, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question to, to get us started. And thank you again, Hani and Claudia and Shannon for, for your presentation today. So one of the things I'm, I'm curious to hear more about um, is 
what were some of both the opportunities and challenges of um, doing participatory research with young people online um, uh, in the context of, of, of COVID-19? I remember when we met to kind of um, discuss the, the, the uh, presentation, one of the things that you shared with me, which I, th I found was found quite interesting is that pre-pandemic, you know, if you're doing research, it might be with a youth organization or with young people that you're already connected with. And in the context of recruitment on the internet, you're suddenly working with young people globally, possibly, right? And, and so, you know, folks are coming into a space not knowing each other for the first time. Uh, and so I'm curious to hear a little bit more about uh, how you navigated uh, all of that. I think we could probably all uh, talk about this, but I'll just jump in. Uh, it's has been in some ways enormously challenging uh, because we most people have their cameras off, we're, which is totally understandable uh, in terms of uh, confidentiality and so on. This is a research project, and uh, so so there so just the idea of you know people not knowing each other and they're in different time zones and they're in different cities and and there's a limit to how much. People can like was like oh well what's the weather like out in Winnipeg or whatever it is it's 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 a it's a challenging piece I think to get for people to get to to know each other um, it's very interesting though the screening the second session has been enormously um, I think kind of liberating for how people how strangers meet uh, because when people actually show and I when Shannon said we had people introduce their cell films there's sort of like like there, people are a bit shy, but they've also put a lot of work into it in the last, you know, five days. So they're very fresh to talk about it. And I think that that the whole idea of uh, an appre appreciation, like the, I mean, we of course are really enthusiastic, but we are anyway, like, oh, this, but this is amazing, but it is, um, but kind of encouraging people to be appreciative as well. And I think we've seen some, we've had some moments that, would just be like worth the worth the whole project just to think of a couple of people sort of saying oh I didn't I, you know I didn't know other people felt that way or oh yeah it's this has been really helpful or wow I love the way you did that animation or like the those kinds of things so definitely that part I think a challenge for sure I mean I do I do a lot of teaching online so I mean these are groups of people who work together for a whole 13 weeks and you still have, you know, challenges. So this piece has, has really, ha you know, causes, I, th I think, to think more about that. Um, so that that's what I'd say. I don't know, uh, Hanny and Shannon, if you want to say anything on this one, or we'll talk about another question or, and, or other challenges. Hanny could give us a long list of challenges. <laughs> no, thank you, Claudia. Uh, actually, you covered all of them, but just to highlight, one uh, one challenge that I, it was really so we have so uh, we have a, a a range of you know age range for the for the required for, uh, as the um, as the uh, um, as, as as so the participant can in in the, as the as the requirement of that uh, of the participation also the location we are we are looking for explore the Canadian youth experiences or or the the experience of um the youth who are living in canada so identifying to make sure that we have the right age group and then they're from the right location it was really really a uh, challenge as as Claudia was mentioned just to highlight this one because it was it was really important for me thank you so much yeah there's i mean there's such a uh, rich set of opportunities and challenges. I'm, I'm even thinking about Claudia, how you mentioned, you know, the, the appreciation that folks showed and the, and the use of chat, right? Like, you know, previously <laughs> pre COVID folks might snap or, um, you know, um, verbally or, uh, you know, uh, sigh or, 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 or do things kind of impromptu and in zoom, it's a bit more stiff, right? Cause people, so yeah. people are mic'd, And so how do we show appreciation and love for, for the collective collaborative work on zoom? Yeah. So interesting. And, and thank you, honey, for your reflections there around recruitment and reach and whatnot. We have a number of questions in chat, so I'm going to um, pick some of them out. Um, we've got a, a question from Mary Lou. What were the costs of making cell phones, cell films, excuse me, if a community group wanted to do this, it would be important, which I agree. So I know all of you have lots of experience with cell filming in um, all sorts of different kind of uh, budget constraints. So I invite any one of you to speak to this. Ooh, well, it's it's free if you have a cell phone because there are no costs of people. Uh, so 
on on one on one i mean the cost of time but nothing else where where we've done community work uh like actually going actually going to sites or supporting sites is to provide we've provided ipads for like in small groups so um i would say if you're doing group projects and you are assuming that kids or whoever you're working with doesn't have to be just youth don't have a cell phone or don't have a cell phone that they could use for this um having a couple of ipads is lots because people can do work in, like we've had four or five people work with this well this is pre-covid well you know it, they could work they could work with the same ipad or they could share an ipad and actually nessa uh who's on the call i think uh had ipads that she had had people sharing and but taking turns using them um so i don't know are there other costs are there hidden costs that i no, just uh, just to mention that also there is no need to buy any type of application yeah. or video editing yeah. program. Uh, it's just uh, because people can follow different uh, uh, instructions. For example, we have no editing required uh, uh, process that people just 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 can shoot the film without any need to edit it. Um, although there is, if someone chooses to to edit the film, there are also free programs that people can can use. Thank you so much. So lots of different options there. Uh, and if folks heard earlier the, the voice that, that that spoke on Zoom when we paused the recording, that was kind of like a no editing required <laughs> action because we, we, um, we're not recording the videos. So uh, that, that technique can be used uh, um, uh, by communities as well. So I'm gonna combine a few questions. We've got a number of great questions. Um, so a question from Elaine, uh, could this be used after data from each youth has Excuse me. Could this be used after data from each youth um, cell phone, cell film, and you know, hearing a little bit more from you about cell filming and knowledge mobilization and translation? Um, Joanna also had a similar question. Any ideas about how young people could be gathered and synergized um, to to kind of see their the impact of their their um, cell films uh, in action? So, what happens essentially after the films get produced? That's a great question. I I I don't I, I shouldn't jump in, but I'm going to jump in anyway. But uh, one of the things we're, we're we're trying to think about is how we can actually come up with some some type of screening of more of the films with small groups, like in a voluntary way. Because we had not we would we would have to do an amendment with our ethics uh, application, but uh, we're we're getting very good at doing amendments. I'm in an amendment mode. I want to change my life. I want to change my mind. So we're trying to think through, you know, the possibility of having more screening. So like every time, like even even in our groups where where there's only three people, sometimes we show five cell films or whatever. Um, I've also been really interested in thinking, and this inspired very much by the work of this uh, uh, this network is on infographics and how we can actually um, at least feed back some of the key learnings in a really youth friendly way. Uh, because, you know, we, 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 for the cell films that we've been showing publicly like this, uh, we've been getting, you know, permission. We went back to the participants and so on. So we're kind of playing around with maybe not necessarily being able to show all the cell films, but being able to show some of the key findings and, and some of the, in a, in a really youth friendly way, uh, because I think I think that will be an important part. People were like kind of proud of being part of the project anyway, or their their parents were. Or uh, one person uh, show her her cell film was screened was seen by hundred at a hundred hits before she ever sent it to us, uh, just from family members. So there's kind of like this idea of being both proud and wanting to see something else. So I don't know, Shannon and Hanny, we really haven't talked so much about this because we're always like oh, the next step, but these ideas of how to get the cell films back to youth, but also the findings back to youth. Um, so I don't know, Shannon, I know you've been thinking a little bit about this too. Yeah, and I agree with you in terms of that, that I think that the ethics is key there. Um, it would be lovely to be able to screen them um, and, and have an, possibly even an, an event where, um, you know, youth could come together and see each other's cell films uh, as, a, as a, a larger group. So I think something like that would be wonderful. Well, I know this project is very much in progress um, as you shared today. And so thanks everyone for, for those questions 
questions because I imagine they might generate lots of rich discussion amongst the team around uh, around next steps. Um, well, we have time for one more question, um, and then we're going to transition to the, the latter half of the event, which is the live discussion. Um, all right, I'm going to read a question uh, from David here. Uh, before COVID and virtual facilitation on Zoom, uh, participatory photo slash video projects often generated lifelong community-based change, uh, changes and relationships. Uh, and I know folks uh, in the PCL have been, have been doing lots of different projects in, uh, for, for a long time, so familiar with that. David asks, from your experience, is that deep relationship building possible when the project operates via online virtual engagement? think so. I think this this project is kind of limited right now because we only have two sessions. So most of the work that that I do that's more uh, working with the community is like sometimes it goes on for years or it goes on for a year or it goes on for eight months. So um, it, I, but I think I think the question, David, that you're raising is a really important one uh, of how do you build any kind of sustainability in you know without ever meeting up with people and uh, I mean in a in a an in person way and I, I think it's possible but I, I think it's, it requires definitely much more strategic thinking about how people work together um, uh, in research groups I've been working with a group in Mali where. We, we just gave a conference presentation uh, an hour ago uh, at CIES, but like finding finding ways to work together still online, but, you know, being desperate to produce our, our PowerPoint together. We had many meetings leading up to it that we wouldn't have ever had had we, been, uh, you know, doing doing it another way. So I think in, in community pieces and this one is is kind of it's kind of a strange community because it's kind of community of youth in this broad way, but trying to think of how people work together for something. And maybe that's maybe we change what that something is and whether it's a presentation or uh, something else. Like I, I think that it's I think we can be very creative about what brings people together and why. And what do people want to get out of it? And what like the again the participant who was so proud of her her piece being seen already by a hundred people in her family was kind of like oh like and and passing that on and other people saying oh really oh maybe i should be showing mine like those i think kind of coming up with maybe different different ways of thinking about what this kind of engagement or participation might look like um i don't know oh hanny and shannon hanny you did so much work in ethiopia at a distance even before COVID. so maybe you have some thoughts about this too um, yeah, I was thinking about this, this really good question. It's, uh, as you mentioned also, it's an important one. Yeah, I think, I think there are, yes, of course, it, there, is, there is a big challenge of uh, doing that, but I think it's, it's possible, there is possibility, but maybe not, uh, maybe the, the nature of uh, that relationship would be different from, uh, you know, there is a possibility of making it, but it would be different from, what we do in the you know in the real uh, field work that we are physically uh, there and we, we are working with participants um, and I was also thinking um, so I I don't have you know a specific uh, answer to this but I'm just sharing what I'm thinking right now um, that um, I, I, I'm I, I'm remembering the the feedbacks that uh, that uh, participants were giving to each other to um, reflecting to each other's work and and uh, I was I, I'm thinking we don't know that there, there might be some uh, relationships relationships are being made by by participants themselves and we are not aware of that because because we don't know how people are getting connected uh, through the online uh, platform to each other for example in the on the chat box they could send a, a messages to each other and we are not, it's not visible for everyone. So um, from, from the feedbacks that people provide to each other, I think there is, a, there is also a possibility. Just I'm just trying to uh, look at from another angle of uh, what Claudia uh, mentioned. I'm thinking too, you should never have asked us this question, David. We're going on forever. But I think uh, something that, it's kind of interesting as people who talk about, participants talk about, 
I was so surprised at my voice on the cell film and how, like how, how, how loud I was or how strong I was. I didn't think of myself. Like these are things that maybe we never capture in, in other types of community work where you're face to face, but you're doing other things. And there, you know, there, there are groups all around. I mean, I, I, I think of myself as living in chaos most of the, you know, bring, where's the cameras, you know, where, the, where did that group go? Are they coming back and whatever. And a lot of things that, that we don't actually know happen in small groups because small groups are, you know, doing other things and, and they would, and, and, and they do it because they're not with us or with me, but kind of interesting pieces that people shared about themselves in the process of making this. And that, I think there's, maybe this is something to come back to young people about is like, what, like, how are you different now? What, like, where, where do you feel confident? Or uh, we, we did some video walks in the course I was teaching recently that Shannon was in. And one person said, I never thought I could talk outside. Like she was, she was walking along with her, her cell phone and talking about her neighborhood and what it was like. And, you know, she was just a, a little piece. And she said, I never, I never before this would have ever talked out loud by myself walking down the street. And I thought, oh, I could do that. Uh, so it's like just these kind of little revelations of people and how, how it's not just participatory work that's changed, but people have, you know, they're, they're doing different things. And maybe some of this, some of that we need to capture more or think about differently and not not just think of it as a, a deficit. I mean, it is a deficit in many ways because uh, I love being with people in person, but what else have I learned that I didn't know or what else have they learned? Mm. Uh, so I'm running out of time just to add that uh, and not all of the uh, participants were strangers to each other or to us. So a few of them were uh, from communities, from the groups that they already had their own group. So um, they came, uh, uh, they came to the to to participate in the sessions uh, while they were they, they already knew each other. So I think uh, also the the the, the nature of uh, this relationship would be different even in those groups that they mm -hmm. already you know have a group and they 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 already had uh, lots of works together. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, thank you for that. What a fa fantastic conversation. And 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 uh, the good news is it's not over. We're going to continue this conversation, but in breakout groups. Um, just to, to maybe ask uh, Hani, Claudia, or Shannon, uh, I know you've got an international cell film uh, festival uh, that, that airs every year. That's a public event that folks can attend. I saw a few questions um, on the chat we didn't get a chance to get to in terms of like who can see these films and are they public and whatnot. And um, uh, of course, I imagine folks have to consent to be part of the the, the uh, self film festival and whatnot. But um, feel free to drop a link um, to that uh, work in the chat. Um, and I believe there's also toolkits on that site in terms of how to do self filming, how yeah. to do it in low resource ways. You don't need a tech expert. There was a question around that in chat, uh, and so. Absolutely, take a look um, online uh, for those resources. Um, we will also send around a, a, a link that isn't. It will be creating it later today or tomorrow. We're actually having a cell film symposium on June the eighth and ninth, uh, and it will be open to anybody. Well, we have speakers lined up, but it will also be open to the public. So that that we will share through the through the Canadian. Uh, uh, to, through the Community-Based Research of Canada, uh, if that's okay with you, so that people might, if you want to learn more and meet, you know, meet all the people who are doing, who are researching this work or doing it in activist ways, uh, we're going to have an NGO panel of uh, NGOs that have been supporting the use of cell films and research, so get their perspective on this as well, so that's also coming. Terrific. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, do share um, those links with us uh, in the chat um, uh, or after as well. All right. And thank you to all of you for your questions. I know we weren't able to get all of them, but we're going to save the chat um, uh, and we can forward the questions out to, to other folks um, uh, a little bit later. And again, we are going to go into breakout groups momentarily. I'm going to explain. I'm going to share my screen here what's going to happen. So you can ask some of these questions directly to the presenters. Just a moment here as I share the screen again. Can folks give me a thumbs up if you can see this okay? Fabulous. 
So because I know that some folks may have to run, I just want to um, uh, announce some of our events that are coming up and, and a big thank you to Claudia, Hani, uh, and Shannon again for your presentation. Um, this uh, particular event uh, wraps up or concludes um, our eight part series, but we're not yet done for the year. We have a really exciting dynamic event coming up at the CBR Canada Awards and Mini CTU Expo on June 1st. Please join us um, at this event. I'm going to ask Sonia uh, to put a link into chat so you can find the event out and register. We've got a terrific panel set up um, and we'll also be hearing from our award winners as well. So, so please join. Also, um, please stay in the loop for upcoming events. Sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we always have uh, things on the go and that's the best place to um, tune in. And last, for those of you who do have to leave, um, we want to say a big thank you before we uh, transition to the second part of the event. And to All right.